parents had this important, you know, role in a child's life to help them make sense of the information coming at them and to help them like gain information and knowledge. We have a different uh, role as parents now in the digital age. It is not helping them with knowledge. It moves from knowledge accumulation to discernment. They have knowledge. They don't need you for knowledge. They have Google, Alexa, and Siri. What gave the church success in the past will kill it today. Uh, We're going to get to that in just a minute, but I want to introduce my good friend, Chesley. Uh, We've already had a conversation out there. Can you tell us a little bit about sort of who you are, uh, where you're positioned today, and then we'll come back to the quote. Yeah, man. My name's Chesley. I've been in ministry for 15 years, and uh, I do what's called co-vocational ministry, meaning I run a business and then I actually do church work on the side. And me and my team um, basically led the groundbreaking study of generational change, technology, and faith in America. And we're really excited about helping, you know, church leaders and just, um, I would say, Jesus followers in general begin to um, engage Gen Z and younger millennials because they're totally different than anything we've ever experienced before. And a lot of that has to do with the advent of digital technology and the iPhone. We shifted from a pre-digital age to a digital age and the way they think and operate totally different than what we have. Um, I'm like Ricky Bobby. I talk with my hands. You'll see that if you're watching on the video, just so you know, if you're watching on the video, my pen blew up in my pocket and uh, I have black all over. So we're just going to get that out of the way. So that way, when I talk with my hands, you're okay. You're not like asking, well, what the heck is all over his hands? It's ink. It's wonderful. 10 minutes before this interview. (laughs) What are the, what are my favorite things about having the podcast is that everybody comes in a different stage. So it's kind of like, so people are like, I just did a run. I just did a run. They're like sweating and like out of breath on the, yeah. on the line or just kind of like, Oh, I just got off this great sales call. So they have all this kind of jazz. Um, one of the wonderful elements I think of uh, zoom or Riverside or some sort of digital based interview is that you catch people at all different stages. Yes, so <laughs> that's super awesome. You uh, mentioned while we were off air, something about, um, change leadership yeah. and about uh, how this is going to work. And I think it's directly applied not only to your quote about the church and the study that you just mentioned to us, but also I think as um, as millennials, as we're now starting to be have um, kids and we're now mm-hmm. starting to be parents in the feel good fatherhood community and just being a feel good father in general. Um, and we just had a conversation about how I'm an Xennial. Yeah. Is that, I think that's how you say it. Xennial, like yeah. How... You're like in that weird <laughs> age group. Yeah. So um, let's talk about, uh, let's weave that path between what does it look like in a community, in a church, and then at home? Yeah. Because our needs, I think, as a species, right, we're, we're, completely, we're completely out of our depth. We're in a completely new new area, similar to agrarian and industrial, right? Yeah, We're absolutely. pre-digital, post-digital, just like you said. Um, so go ahead. Yeah. Uh, you know, for 1700 years, the church um, had a geographically central model where, you know, at the beginning of Christendom, when they were able to come out of hiding, they began to build and design cities around the church. And the reason why they had to do it is because they lived in an agrarian society where people would work 30 minutes from the church, you know, in the fields. And I say 30 minutes because everybody always works or drives 30 minutes. Um, Theirs was um, walking. And so they were had to be a walking distance of the church or horse ride uh, distance of the church. And they were out in the fields from sunup to sundown until, um, until Sunday. And Sunday was this day for the community to gather around to, to care for one another, to, to be with one another and to listen to scripture. So this was a pre-literate age and in an agrarian society. So they had to have a platform that allowed them to be able to express and practice their faith in a way that they needed at that time. 
And for 1700 years, that was a building with a central person at the pulpit explaining scripture as they read it, because most of the people listening could not read. And so it worked and it was important. And they wanted to design their entire lives around their faith in God. And uh, we, we it worked for a very long time until it didn't. And it, I don't I believe it started really deteriorating in the 60s with uh, local television coming on and becoming widespread. And it became uh, a different environment. And we've been feeling that edge away from a uh, pre-literate age. Now we're in a, a post-literate age where we have audible and we have video where reading is becoming less and less of a need. So we're seeing our communication even change to more visual communication that explains mm. more in pictures than, than words do. And so I'm thinking I, I, a lot of, I'm thinking a lot of like life church here, like yeah, where yeah. the, what in my understanding of the church structure is that um, a lot of it is so, Christianity has always been defined to me, and I love this explanation. It's a personal pronoun mm. religion. Mm -hmm. It's my relationship with my God. It's your relationship with my God. It's like these these pro these personal pronouns. Yeah. Um, and a part of that has been, is translated into, as you described, your relationship with your pastor or your priest, and um, sort of building everything in community and in relationship. And that's a lot of that is covered in in the Bible about. Um, when people come together, right there, I am kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I'm interested to know, like, let's kind of paint a picture of fatherhood during that period. Yeah. Cause I think for our feel good fathers, it'll really help our faith based and also our secular listeners kind of understand the perspective that, that we're coming here, uh, that we're coming from here about how this impacts the family unit. Cause that's really where we're going to bring this conversation. Yeah. So if I could talk a little bit about that, that would be really great. And when I, when I think of church history, I'm thinking of history uh, of humanity more sociologically than I am religiously. So for those of those of your listeners that aren't faith-based, like this is important because I'm talking about a, sh a monumental shift between a pre-digital age and a digital age which is where we live now. I have two kids, eight and nine. Um, if you parent them like my parents parented me in a pre-digital age, you will lose. <laughs> and so, and you'll lose because of the way we, uh, we understand, our kids understand logic. They do not process information the way we processed information before the advent of social media and the internet and uh, information 24 seven. So, <clears throat> they have to do it from a an experiential base. What that means from a from a historical level, though, is parents would parent their kids um, very side by side um, in a very hierarchical structure that they needed, and they they built a class system around this. But parents um, didn't buck that. That this was the way they knew the world. And um, they would help their kids try to succeed in it. The other part of this is because if you look at the Maslow hierarchy of needs, um, we did not have the technology and they lived in a place where they were just trying to figure out commerce. Um, they were really focused on the bottom two or three levels of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So uh, psychological safety and <laughs> personal transformation was not a thing they cared about at that moment. Um, that was one of the reasons why Christianity uh, grew so quickly, because it was it was about this thing that became transcendent. It was about this opportunity to be a part of something bigger. And before that, they just, you know, everybody understood this need for a spiritual deity in their lives because of that. But there wasn't that individual take until the Renaissance. And so we see parents parenting because of their cultural time and their their uh their societal space that they they were in and it was very geographically driven so there was a hierarchical model just to work in that system these people that had money were the ones that provided for these people so these people had to provide labor to to continue the cycle 
and they were bringing their kids into there knowing um, that their kids would never escape this because they never escape this. This is how life works. Um, fast forward 1,500, 20, you know, almost 2,000 years, we live in a very different society. We have grown in our, in our understanding of ec economics, of social environments and structures, governments. Um, and now we are moving into this upheaval, if you will, of the way we live our lives, which is absolutely individualistic now because this thing, the, the phone, has now made me an autonomous figure. I can have my own economy on here. I can have my own government on here. I can have my own philosophy, my own religion. Everything can, is centered around me because of the digital technology literally at my fingertip. And information is now devalued to a commodity. So now where parents had this important you know, role in a child's life to help them make sense of the information coming at them and to help them like gain information and knowledge, we have a different uh, role as parents now in the digital age. It is not helping them with knowledge. It moves from knowledge accumulation to discernment. They have knowledge. They don't need you for knowledge. They have Google, Alexa, and Siri and chat GPT, baby. <laughs> and I was going to say, and now they got AI, right? So, yeah. yeah. So, um, we're any parent that parents based off of a knowledge base is behind the times. They don't need knowledge, they need discernment. And we all know every teenager thinks they know it all and they know nothing. <laughs> so it's important. So discernment, discernment is a super, it's a, it's a super good term. Yeah. Right. So other terms that are similar to that, like wisdom, mm -hmm. um, being able to make decisions, standing up uh, or values based. These are all kind of elements kind of in the same circle. I find this particular conversation absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Um, I love the framing of it. it. It's things are starting to make a lot more sense. Um, intuitively as, as to what's happening with kids, what's happening with parents, um, and the struggle, you know, when I think of feel good fathers, uh, a very consistent theme is, uh, breaking generational bonds, uh, forging your own path. And in fact, being a feel good father at the center of that is knowing what you value and you being a good person individually. Yeah. And then that kind of expands out from there. And so when we combined this element that you said about our kids are learning experientially that they need these experiences um another part of that and we, what we know that kids and parrots do is they look at the moral founding they look at the value base they look at the discernment skills of their parents above them and they will emulate that until they can come up with their own opinion yeah right yeah and, so, and everything that is worth learning is caught it's not taught like we mm. we have to say something so many times and then they go to church and their youth pastor says something and they get it, <laughs> you know, and, and parents are like, no, <laughs> why can't it be me? Well, it was you, but they have to listen to it a certain amount of times before they catch it. And um, oftentimes a different medium will allow them to catch something that you've been saying for a long time. That is yeah. important because you've used repetition over time to allow them to be able to hear what is said when their youth pastor, I'm using youth pastor, maybe it's a teacher, maybe it's a coach, um, somebody significant other than the parent in their lives to cement what you've already been laying down as the foundation. If you don't have that foundation, you're not going to win. Um, I, I know you have other questions. I, I wanna get back to uh, how we process information as a pastor, uh, as, a, sure. as a child and a parent now, but let's, let's go with your question. Um, that's a great, that's a great segue into the next thing. We can, we can hold questions for later. Okay. Processing parents, because I was going to say, hey, this is super great. What I want to say is like in the past, we had a uh, hierarchical structure yeah. walking alongside. Yeah. But now, um, and I'm remiss to say, hey, as a feel-good father, you want to kind of be a partner with your kids because there still needs to be a parent <laughs> yes. and a kid. Yeah. Like they're still like, as a parent, you're still responsible for them. They're not autonomous units yet. Yeah. And so- what, um, and that's, and, and that's not a societal or a cultural thing. That's the law. Yeah. Like that's just the law. Like mm -hmm. until they're 18, they're 
technically your property, which is weird to say, and I'm sure that's going to trigger some people, but it's just the law and you're responsible for them as a parent. And so mm -hmm. this is where that discernment and knowledge and values and, and taking responsibility for your family is important for a good father. So that's the past. So what does it look like today? Because a, a lot of feel good fathers are this. A lot of feel, feel good fathers are navigating the space yeah. of <clears throat> now my kid doesn't need me for information. Mm, yeah. Uh, we got taught how to raise our kids based off of how we were raised. So you know, they don't ever give us a playbook. Some of us read books. Some of us uh, try to watch YouTube videos. But the vast majority of what we have bringing into parenthood is the way our parents raised us. Well, that's very difficult if you raise a kid that's my my kid's age, eight, eight and nine, um, with digital technology. We We were raised at the cusp of the digital age, which was, you know, I would say the digital age started in the seventies, but we didn't feel the, we didn't feel the vast shift in it until, you know, I was 20. Um, the internet came, right. I remember 95 when they started doing AOL right. and NBA.com, mm -hmm. which was what I was getting on there for, you know, as a kid was a Michael Jordan, you know, but at the, um, but what we're dealing with now is this ability, you know, the advent of the iPhone gave every person access to information all the time, all at once. And then you add uh, TV. Um, there was a, uh, a thought leader in the 60s. His name was Marshall McLuhan. Marshall McLuhan um, was thinking about the way the world would shift in what he called the electronic age, which is what we're calling the digital age. And he felt like they were at the beginning of it in the 60s. And so he would talk about this almost as like a prophet out of time where he would say things that people were not understanding. But if you go back and read it now in the 2020s, you realize, wow, this guy, <laughs> this guy's way, way smarter and way more thought provoking and understanding of where the future was headed back then than even some of us are today. And what he said was that when you have information coming at you all at once, all the time, from every direction, logical didactic reasoning can no longer work for you. So if I could turn this into way more simplification, simplified language, right brain versus left brain. Mm -hmm. Right brain is creative. Left brain is didactic and logical. So it takes time. It's the left brain side, the left side of your brain processes speech, which means everything needs to come down into a logical framework. And for centuries, people were processing logically because they had time to process logically. What's faster at processing is emotions, which is the right mm -hmm. side of your brain, which is where creati creativity lies. And what happens when you get too much information all at once, all the time, you can no longer take the time to process logically because it takes time. It takes reflection. It takes, um, it, it's slow. It's not horribly slow, but it's slow. And if you know somebody like me, who's a verbal processor, I start scatterbrained, but by the end of it, you see this nice little framework occurring by, you know, by the end. And now I've had time to talk about this stuff that we're talking about today. But this is this is why this is so important for parents and, and kids. And I'm talking from a digital um, researcher, from somebody that helps organizations um, communicate with a digital generation. And so I'm hoping mm. that as you're listening to this, you're seeing how this can apply to parenthood. When you cannot process in your left brain um way a mode of thinking where you can actually turn everything into logical framework what ends up happening is experience and how you feel about that experience dictates your response to that stimuli period then what ends up happening is because it's too slow and the world's moving too fast logic can never catch up and so what ends up happening, and this is what Marshall McLuhan was saying, is that the children of the electronic age will begin to become the holistic man, where they have to feel things, they have to touch things, they have to sense things, they have to, they have to be inundated in experience, and they'll form their worldviews holistically. They will not form them 
logically. And mm. so what we have done as teachers, what we've done as politicians, what we've done as business leaders, what we've done as parents, and what we've done as pastors for you know, millennia is talk through the left sides of our brains. And now we're dealing with a, a generation, young millennials, Gen Z, Gen Alpha, that do not process the world like that. So when I say you need discernment, you as a parent have to take the moment to take them back to give them space and respite. I'm moving back physically. So if you hear some modulation in my volume, because this is what I do. I talk like Ricky Bobby, man. Um, you know, we, uh, we have, a, we have a, a duty to pull them back so that they can reflect, to give them a safe space to begin to take all of their experience and move them into logical frameworks. We can't just give it to them anymore. Because this they sounds know a lot more like you do. That that's definitely true. This sounds a lot like when I think about modern parents and modern thought leadership in this space, like having the 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 questions and answers at the at the table, providing a space, like not saying like what was your day. It's like how did you win? Like framing the experiences of the day in uh, in some way that provides some sort of like later on life value, like yeah. a life lesson. Yeah. And when I think of, um, ah, there it is. The, the term is intentional parenting. Mm -hmm. When I think about that movement, yeah. the, the whole idea about that, that world is that you're intentionally, it sounds like you're, and this is probably a miss. Uh, and, well, let me know in the comments if I'm wrong. I'd love that. Uh, that, uh, you're drawing out and you're cementing this, um, cloud of emotions and feelings and images, because that's kind of how the brain works in the experiential world. Um, and then cementing that into, well, here's what I think about it. And I, I've noticed that even for myself in this world, navigating it, that a lot of times I'm like, you know, I have a lot of feelings about that. I need to know what I think about it first. I need to yeah. take, take a step back, go to my journal, write some things down. I don't know what I think yet. And so I just know what I feel about it. Yeah. This really describes, I think, a lot of the world. It really describes now in this framework how what we're, we see in the world and culture, in modern culture, basically in the world everywhere, how this is all working. Um, and it was really funny because it was, it was interesting. You were saying earlier about like the didactic versus the experiential. Mm -hmm. Well, kids throughout time have always been, they've never been didactic. didactic. Correct. There's a certain point, like I, I don't think it's, in order to be that intelligent side, the, the processing side, you need to have abstract thought. You need to be able yep. to like connect different different elements. And kids don't have that until they're in their teens. Yes. They just don't have that. Right. <laughs> so so it's kind of so there's so I feel like there there is some good, there's probably some solid wisdom that can that we can still draw from the past on how to navigate today. And I think that's like all those um principles or classic elements of like being an intentional parent will still apply. Um so the next question is like, given, given that information, mm -hmm. sort of the next step is for a feel good fathers is all right, we understand holistic. We understand that they need more experiences. How do we, what can we do to show up? Like in your experience, how do you apply this to your family so that we can learn from you? Yeah, that's good. Far be it for me to tell people how to raise their parents. I was a youth pastor for a little while. So I'm like, I do not know how to raise teenagers. I have an eight, nine year old. I know how to raise two year olds. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, exactly. I'll tell you how we did it. And that's probably not true. There's, you know, as a pastor, what, and I'm 36, what I've learned about my life is that um, my theology is wrong. I just don't know mm. where, you know, so mm. my, my, uh, I, I feel like that with parenting as well, like my wisdom and parenting, and even the research that we've done, we have all this knowledge, and then I'm wrong in certain areas. So I can tell you from my experience, what I see, what we've observed. Um, and I, I'll give you stories and anecdotes like how I'm <laughs> navigating this with my kids. Um, you know, we absolutely have family, family values. Like I, I am very clear to my kids of this is how we, the Lundays, treat people. This is mm. how we do things here. If you have my last name, um, this is how you will act. This is non-negotiable. These are core values for the Lunday household. So those things are absolutely, I think, uh, need to be clear, concise, consistent, and repeatable over time. 
So um, I'm huge on kindness for my kids. I'm huge on curiosity and adventure for my kids. Like, I don't want failure to be a bad word because in a digital age, when you're moving the way we're moving, uh, failure is the way you learn. It is not this didactic, logical framework of knowledge. It's actually getting in there and figuring it out as you go and be willing to move and learn faster and take chances. Um, sitting down and following rules just for the sake of we don't want any disruption that's not helpful in a time of disruption <laughs> that mm. actually makes you fall farther behind. So I think at some point my kids will, and maybe some other, you know, another generation removed, my grandkids might get to a point where uh, things simmer down a little bit, maybe where we hit some sort of equilibrium, but we're, we're not, we're, we're disrupting our, our business uh, the way we make money, we're disrupting the way we practice our faith, we're disrupting the way we do governments. I mean, you look at what we're doing with Web3 and the fact that we might be able to have a digital AI powered government. I know that will scare some people, but what it does is it takes out the corruption of men that don't say, say one thing and do another, which is great for me. I mean, I'm sure there's, you always pick your problems on whatever thing you do. Um, but when it comes to my children, um, man, I can think of one story in particular. So, uh, my little boy, if you end up listening to this 20 years down the road, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> and you had no say in my conversation today. So, um, we're dealing with a, uh, we're dealing with a time where you can get any information anywhere from any kid, from any, and, you know, sexuality at eight, nine years old is huge. Mm -hmm. And um, a, uh, I'll just call him a friend, a very close, actually, it was a family member, a close family member introduced my little boy um, to porn. And mm. my wife found it on YouTube. Back in the day when I was, yeah, on YouTube. On for YouTube, kids, that's. Of all places. Um, we, uh you know, we, we have the gates, the gateways. Like when I was a kid, my parents tried to be digital and do all that stuff. And we knew all the workarounds. My kids have no chance. I know all the workarounds, you know? And so, um, but there's still, there's still things that squeak through. And then you have these relationships um, and it's coming from all places all at once. When I was a kid, my parents would have said, I told you not to do that. Here's a consequence for your actions, mm. you know? even at nine, when I had no clue what, what I was getting myself into. Well, yeah. because of the information age, the digital age, I can now tell my child, this is what happens. It's like, this is your brain on drugs. <laughs> you know, um, porn mm. is a drug. And we know that now. We know because of brain science, how it malforms your brain, if you look at it, for any length of time and, and with any sort of consistency. And so my parents could not give me the why behind the what. Mm. So it did, it lacked a, a simple, um, the simple framework of discernment for my parents. My parents was don't do this. It wasn't don't do this because other than there's a religious reason behind it, but there was no sure. real ramification that I, my parents could tell me because they didn't have that information. But for my kid, I had to sit down and go, okay, why did you come to him? Like, what was your thought process in going to your family member rather than coming to your dad? And mind you, the family member is only like 12. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you know, sure. Just a couple years older. And, and so we had this really deep conversation. And then we talked about, hey, these are the reasons why things, you know, you could get hurt. And you just unlocked a door. So you're going to feel some urges from now on. Um, that you're not going to know what to do with. And the first thing you're going to want to do is find that video. And mm. what I want you to know is you have a safe place to come talk to mom and dad about when you're feeling those things, because I got taught you don't feel those things and you'll get punished if you do. Mm. And that was the information my parents had at the time, you know, <laughs> And we want honesty. Honesty is a big value in our house. You can do almost anything, but if you lie, we have a problem. So my kid didn't even lie. He just, when I found out, we talked to him and we said, did this happen? And he said, yes. 
and he got really, you know, solemn and embarrassed. And just like you would, you feel that shame. Um, but it was my job as a parent to look beyond the action and to understand the why behind the action. Because what my primary job as a parent is not just to lay down a boundary and say, you will never cross it, but to help him understand why we don't cross it. Mm. And so that way he can begin. And this repetition of that framework of going, what was the boundary? Okay, there's consequences for the action. This is something that was new for us. So there was no consequence that was, you know, was even considered or communicated with him by this. This was something that he had no clue he was he was touching something wrong at that point. Now he does, you know, so now there's a mm. consequence. But beforehand, there wasn't because what am I going to do? Tell you you can't? You have consequence enough. Now you know deep inside this was not supposed to happen because it's deeply private. So we've had to we've had to work through that and that framework of repetition to help my kids. We do that in everything. So they mm. are they may not understand it right now. But once they get to about 15, when, when their motor functions and their brain start changing where they can actually get it, they'll begin because of the repetition we've done over the time. Even though there are times we just want to just tell you what to do because I said so. And that's one of my favorite things to do as a dad is because my dad did it to me because I said so. Why? Because I'm the boss, you know. Uh, but yeah. when these big things happen or these things that I know there's going to be consequences for down the line if I don't put this framework in place of going, here was the action. Let's talk about why you decided to do the action. Um, what were you feeling? What were you thinking? What do you think would be a better opportunity the next time? And how do we help you build a, an escape route for when you're feeling that way? So you know that there's always safety to come actually work through those feelings and those emotions. Because if you hide them, you're going to end up doing the same thing over and over. And that's what causes addiction. And so we I do love that repetitiously with our kids. I love the, um, the perspective of creating the character. You're creating, um, and not the character is in a yeah. persona or something their like that. Is yes. in their character. Yeah. You're creating their character based on what ultimately is internal values spread out, mm -hmm. right? And so as a, as a feel-good father, right, you understand what you value, that has ripple effects if done correctly. Yeah. If it has a positive, um, positive um, additive um, effect on people around you, that the effect, the 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 net effect is a multiplicative effect on everybody up through society. Um, absolutely love that. Yeah. Uh, the um, I love the framing as well of the uh, the boundary based versus now like we were talking about how do you go from the boundary, the didactic, the logic thing, we just don't do that to an experiential conversation and learning. What a great example for how to apply that. Mm -hmm. And then finally, um, the fact that it was an open and meaningful conversation about sex and sexuality with your kids as they're coming of age and like setting them up for success, uh, super meaningful, especially in the world. Um, this was a son, especially in the world of where they're going, like yeah. in what they're kind of walking into and what, yeah. what the world is. Um, I think that's a classic example of uh, how do you help? Um, I mean, the conversations that we've been having as a society for 20 to 30 years. Mm -hmm. How do we make men? Yeah. Right? I, emotional that's a conversation. is the number one most important thing you can cultivate in a kid in this day and age. Number one. Right. Intelligence means very little. Like it, it, it's important, but it's not nearly as important as being able to regulate your emotions. Mm. And that is, and I think in the world of, um, sort of frame that with the conversation before, like if you're in a, I don't know if it's didactic and holistic yeah. learning, but in that experiential where you're processing everything emotionally, yeah. emotional intelligence has, or mindfulness or whatever the heck you want to call it has, has an exponential impact on your ability to number one, not get drawn into nonsense on the internet. Right. Um, cause we know that most of that is nonsense, but actually to, um, do and to, to phrase in the way that I like to look at the world is that phrase it in a way that, well, now that there's something that you want to impact positively or negatively, um, in the world, now you can go get to work. Yeah. I think, you know, because my kids live in a digital world now, um, and because they're processing holistically rather than didactically, like we all did that, but it was slow. Like. 
they're having to process information that they're getting that evokes emotion via video mm. via you know you, most of my kids don't read but even us like <laughs> in the you know in blogs and stuff like that like there's clickbait and there's things that evoke they evoke emotion so what i'm trying to do as a parent at this point is like help them associate the emotion healthily so that they can move in quick time because they're going to know, well, it, when I feel this, this is what happened. So even with my son, it's like, okay, you know, the shame that you're feeling, this is why you're feeling. And this is what will happen when you feel it. Like, so um, if you mm. don't want to feel that, or if you start to feel that this is how to make that adjustment in the future. And again, he's mm. nine, so he's not going to get this. It's more about repetition to help him learn and practice. But I find like, you know, in the ancient way of, of learning specifically i mean jesus's way of his model of teaching was like um i model and then i assist you and then i watch you do it and then i leave and so when i think about my kids and where they're at in their development like that's my framework i have jesus to look at as an example i'm here to model what it looks like to be a healthy adult for you and i'm going to assist you in doing that we're going to do this together and there's a point there that i'm going to watch you and when i watch you there's these ways of like helping them connect the dots like when i'm a model and i'm i'm at the beginning what i call the four phases uh, i call this the hero's journey in my frameworks when i'm when mm. i'm talking to leaders and developing them the hero's journey there's a journey for the hero but there's also a journey for the guide and at the first phase, they're unconsciously incompetent. So what you do on the first phase of development, and this is for any human, not just any, just, not just kids, but this is just true. Kids, it takes a long time because it's more and more and more and more and more and more than, you know, and adults, they can catch things a little bit quicker because they process it faster. But we're always, we always start with whatever we're learning new as unconsciously incompetent. We don't know what we don't know. And so as a guide, and that's who I am, I'm the leader in this situation. I'm the parent in this situation. My first job is to be a director. The leader's job is to be a director. And what that means is I tell you what to do. I'm showing you what to do, but I'm telling you this is the way we do it here. So that way you know. What ends up happening is when you tell them this is what we do and how we do it, um, they fall off that, that, that cliff. <laughs> <laughs> into conscious incompetence. And unfortunately, this is where most parents, where most leaders uh, fall. They, they actually do bad. Once you get to conscious incompetence, then you have to tell them and teach them how to do it, where it's the side-by-side -side thing. We love to tell you what to do. We all hate the time and effort and the uh, what feels like uh, no return on investment of sitting there and working with you to teach you how to do it right. And we have to give room for failure and they have to be able to continue to do it over and over and over and over and over again without fear of repercussion. So as a leader, you move from the director to the coach. And this is so important because as a basketball coach, I'm teaching kids how to shoot. There's a proper form in how to shoot. And if you don't get the form right, you're not gonna win. You're not going to get consistent results, but I don't beat the heck out of them or make them run every time they miss a shot. No, I want them to shoot 10,000 times and we make tiny little adjustments over time. They're going to have the proper form. And it's because I sat there and I waited and I learned, I learned how they operate. Like one of the best things that I learned as a basketball coach is how they process and emulate information. I had one girl, every time she would practice the follow-through method, the balance eyes, elbow follow-through with shooting, she would practice it and model it with the right hand without a basketball. When, when she got the basketball, she would shoot with her left hand. Or uh, hmm. actually, it was the other way around. She would, she would actually model it with her left hand, but shoot with the right hand because she's right-handed, and she would miss every time. I saw what she did in practice, realized she's shooting with her left hand, uh, you know, metaphorically, if you will. So I said, why don't you shoot with your left hand? She started making her shots consistently. 
But as a mm -hmm. coach, I was observing them so that they would get better. As a parent, I've got to observe my kids to go, hey, let's let's pull it back. Like, I've noticed you've been doing this. Like, let's let's make a little adjustment here rather than going like, hey, you did it wrong, <laughs> you know, or hey, go yeah. to your room. You're grounded. You did it wrong. Now I'm having to be the coach. What happens at this? And this is true when you get to uh, teenage years. They revert at 12 to 13 during puberty. They revert back to being a toddler. So um, cool. mentally, so developmentally, they're back there. That's why you feel like, man, at one moment, they could feel like 20 years old. That next moment, it's like I'm back to a two-year-old again. They cannot process the world well because of the hormonal stuff going on. They revert back to two and three years old. So that's where you have to go back in the developmental phase with a teenager. But as they move out of that, all of that, all of that coaching and repetition you did before they hit puberty is now cemented because of the hormonal cascade that they have through puberty. Mm. So you start feeling, and this is where differentiation, they're actually getting good, but they're unconsciously competent now. And so now you have to connect the dots. So you go from, this is what you do. This is how you do it. So director coach to guide. This is why you mm. do it. And mm. you don't just tell them why you do it. You give them four essential questions that you have to ask. And those four essential questions are this. this it's, um, well, tell me about what worked. Tell me what was confusing in that situation. Tell me what was missing in that situation. And then tell me what you would never do again. <laughs> And then let's, let's come up with another way of doing it next time, you know, and what you're doing is you're making them think through the process of whatever this was. And this can happen in any situation, but if you know these steps of development, you understand them, then you can become a better, a better leader and developer of people. And that is our number one priority as a, as a parent is you're developing people to begin to think teach them how to think, not what to think. They're going to think differently than you want them to anyway. And so as a, pa as a pastor and as a parent, I've been using Jesus's model that he would use with his disciples. And it's this model assist, watch and lead. As a leader, I'm a director, then I'm a coach, then I'm a guide. And then the fourth stage, which nobody hardly does, is catalyst. Hmm. And this is as a parent, and I, I'm saying this knowing that I'm not to this stage with my kids yet. But the job of a leader is to leave <laughs> at a right. specific stage. And that stage is when they, when you realize they're consciously competent and they're ready to get on their own, they're, they're going to need a push out of the nest before they're ready and before you're ready. And the only way for them to succeed is for us to push and let them fly on their own because they don't know they have the ability to, because they've been looking at you. And so if you don't do this, well, they differentiate and you see kids at 18, 17, 18 years old, knowing it's time to get out of the nest, but mommy and daddy want to keep them there because they don't know if they did a good enough job developing. And yeah. you know, there's some ego things in the parents that are going, what happens to my identity after they leave? Um, and this is true for any leader. We need to help give them the platform to stand on. We give them the resources that we didn't have with some limitations on purpose, right? So we're not going to give them $5 million and go, you're good. No, we're going to give them some metrics of success, but we're going to give them access to relationships that they didn't have before. And I think in the digital age, we've got to really hone in what our role is in a specific time. And if we understand how to develop our kids and how to develop other leaders, you know, obviously we're talking about fatherhood, but in the digital age, I think this goes for any leader. If we figure out where we're at in the space and we have identifiable markers as a leader or as a parent, we'll be in to go, oh, I shouldn't react that way. I may be upset right now because it hurts me that they're a reflection on my name, but um, I'm going to take a step back. I'm going to gather my emotions and then I'm going to engage with them again. And then I'm going to engage them as the way they need me to engage with them. Because oftentimes they haven't been taught how to do something. They've been told what to do, but never taught how to do it. And you're mm -hmm. expecting them to do it themselves perfectly the second time or the third time, you know? And so um, we've got to move back and go, okay, 
uh, they don't understand this. So let's adjust. Let's figure this out. Let's what is their what are they doing that is consistently getting in the way of this problem that they can't seem to overcome? Well, what if we do something new here? You know, and that's what you do as a coach in that area. I, this is very long winded answer to this question, but um, yeah, it's it's wonderful because uh, I'm reading a book right now by Dr. Manchin. It's about the modern dad, mm -hmm. and it talks about um, evolutionarily what is our role. Mm -hmm. So in the animal kingdom, most of the time, one of the parents is gone when the when the offspring are born, yeah. but we're unique in that um, because of the developmental stage of our offspring, of our kids and children that were there more. And so we are, we are nominal as a species on the mm -hmm. planet. And we already know this in, in, in faith, we already know this, but like, if we want to use the evolutionary version of it, yeah. um, our role, one of our big roles um, based on, I think it's like paleontology and like looking at how we've grown up is that as a father, we're all about helping them thrive. That yeah. it's, you know, like in the beginning, there's always the resources. Can we keep them alive? But in today's world of abundance where food isn't scarce anymore, like food's abundant everywhere. I, I understand and listener feel good father. I understand. I know the, the reality of the world, but in general, in general, we, we've kind of solved this food issue. We can produce enough of it. Um, now we're at this, this stage where how do we bring people? Because what we want is for our children to be successful. What we yeah. want for them is to have a great life. How do we do that? How do we help them to thrive? We don't necessarily need to show them how to survive. I love the fact that like a big piece of it is like you're central to the story until you're not. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. And what a, what a fantastic framework to, to build from. Um, I'm not looking forward to until I'm not. I don't think any parent is, uh, but I am absolutely... Um, looking forward to from the feel good father perspective of curiosity of, as I've said uh, multiple times, I'm interested in knowing who my daughter is going to be. And yeah. one day she's going to be ready. And I'm going to be like, great. In the same way that when she was like four or five, I said, time to go to your neighbor. We've already met the neighbor. You know who they are. I can see you from here. You can walk, you can leave the driveway. You understand how cars work. You can leave the driveway and go knock on the door and go play with your neighborhood friend. Yeah. And watch that timidness of walking to the edge of the driveway, of peeking out and looking down the road. If you're listening, I'm leaning, looking down the road in my pantomime yeah. and going and knocking that door and building a neighborhood friend, yeah, like a real life friend. And that's like, to me, that's the model for her life is how can I get her to the point where she can go down the street and play with her neighborhood friend without yeah, it's me. It's not easy because there's this inner journey that as a leader, as a parent, um, you have to do in the process. And that is moving from being the hero of the story to the guide. And I think most parents, uh, most people in general, because we live in our bodies and we understand our brains and we're living our experience, um, we tend to think we're the hero, whether we understand that or not. And so mm. the kid's story is my story as a parent and my story as the hero of my story versus mm -hmm. there's a shift when I become not the center of the story anymore. I become the most powerful character of the story, which is the guide. The hero mm -hmm. is weak and feeble and doesn't understand how they're going to uh, overcome this situation until they do. And the guide is to help them overcome. But it's, the story is not about the guide. The story is about the hero. And so often I find, and I'm, I'm, ex I'm saying this from experience with my parents and I, I think, and I, my parents did the best they could like with what they had. I was homeless when I was a teenager. Um, I did not learn, we're highly religious, but I did not learn emotional intelligence until I was in my thirties. Um, mm -hmm. because my mom also was undiagnosed with, uh, with multiple, um, behavioral health issues, um, mm -hmm. and mental and learning disabilities that, um, that we just didn't, we didn't know, you know, until when she was in her mid forties. And so that really changed, you know, that really, we were feeling all the effects of that of my mother not getting help. And even still, my mom is the hero of her story and w as well as she could, but she tries to be the hero of her kid's story. 
as well. And so, and we have a lot of grace for her. And she's, she's done so good. But I, you know, we all have these moments where we have to make a decision. Is this about me or is this about them? And what can I do selflessly to help them win? And so, and we ha- that means we have to be aware of our shortcomings, what we're feeling and, and how we're reacting. And when am I being selfish versus when am I being helpful? And mm. that's, that changes us in the process of 18 to 20, 25 years of raising kids. It obviously has changed me over the last eight, nine years of raising my kids. I was a lot more selfish uh, nine years ago than I am today. I'm sure if everything goes well and God willing, I'll be less selfish uh, when my kids are 18 <laughs> yeah, than I am today. 100%. Hopefully. My fingers are crossed. Hey, um, Chesley, my friend, fantastic. If folks want to get a hold of you and learn more about this process or just more, learn more about what you do, how can they find you? Yeah, um, it, I love to help anybody out. Uh, this is a great conversation because I think... It, we really serve the church um, when it comes to helping them engage Gen Z. Obviously, we've talked a little bit about that today, just younger generations, how they process what kind of worship experiences will work for them in the future so that they can grow in their faith. And if you'd like to know more about that, my uh, best way to do that is this huge groundbreaking research project we did. We're giving out the findings for free. And we're doing that at chesleylunday.com, C-H-E-S-T-L-Y-L-U-N-D-A-Y.com forward slash future of faith. And you can get that for free there. Got it. Link will be down in the bio. Uh, Chesley, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, man. Okay. You got to subscribe to the Feel Good Fatherhood Show. Why? Because you will get to listen to Jay's best interview ever. That's probably not me. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Chesley, love that. We'd love to have you listen anyways. So the subscribe button is over there. And then right above my head is the next video. So Google, in all of its wisdom, has decided that this video is the one that most aligns with your needs and interests. Go ahead and give it a click. I guarantee you it's one of these interviews and you're going to love it. All right.